listening to the 10 Questions with the Musical Mind podcast with your host, Peter Harris. Hey everybody, Peter Harris here. Welcome back to 10 Questions with the Musical Mind. This episode, I am happy to welcome Jeff Pilsen on board. Jeff and I uh, get together and discuss uh, specifically his new album, The End Machine, where he is playing with Mick Brown, Robert Mason, and of course, Georgia Lynch. Um, Jeff is, of course, a member of the classic lineup of Dokken. For the last decade or so, he's been with Foreigner and, you know, in between stages with Dio and a lot of high profile gigs. And he's so much more than a bass player. He's a songwriter, producer, musical director. He's a man of many hats. So, um, this is a great conversation with Jeff, and once you get done with this episode, be sure to check out the rest of our blog and site at peters-principles.com. That is the home of the 10 Questions with a Musical Mind podcast. It's peters-principles.com. So here we go with Jeff. Hey Jeff, how are you today? I am doing great. Great, great. So glad to have you join us. I appreciate it. Hey, uh, should I refer to you as Dominic Moon the entire interview? Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, we should, we can have a Dominic Moon segment, I suppose. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you, of course, you got a lot going on. Um, how did it, the, the end machine come about? What, did it Was a Genesis... You and George, or George, or you, and you know, were Mick and Robert involved from the get go, or how did that all start? Well, at, the way it started is George was actually supposed to be, he was contracted from Frontiers, the label, uh-huh. to work on a uh, Jack Russell solo record. Okay. And then for some reason, and I honestly don't know the details, that ended up falling through. I don't think it was anybody, I don't think it was a bad blood or anything, but for some reason it fell through. And George was still kind of tasked with doing a record. So, um, he and he had already asked me if I wanted to be involved when it became a Jack Russell thing. So, um, so uh, and which I had said yes, of course, because George and I love any opportunity to write together, and, and it was great. So, um, anyways, so we started, we decided we were gonna just start writing and do our, our own project of some sort. We didn't really know what it was gonna be. Um, and then Frontiers Records uh, said, well, hey, why don't you get Mick Brown involved? And we said, well, that sounds great. So when then Mick decided to do it, then I don't remember whether it was Frontiers or us who came up with Robert Mason as a singer idea, but um, once we did and Robert decided to do it, we had it all cemented and sure. we knew we had a really good thing at that point. So, um, so uh, I would say the genesis was slow, a little bit slow, but once it got started, everything went very, very quickly. Cool. Yeah, it's a... Uh... Sounds like the the stars aligned finally at some point. But um, now let me ask you: You produced this album, correct? Is an experienced producer. About how do you separate your quote unquote producer decisions from your role as a player? Is it hard for you, or is it easy? Or? No, it's, it's actually not. I, I mean, I've you know I've kind of been either the musical director or something in in many of the bands I've been in, mm-hmm. uh, especially over the last several years. Um, so I've always kind of had to have the kind of ear that a producer has anyways in almost everything I do. Right. Uh, and, and I think I've, I'm just kind of used to combining with that with bass playing. I've never looked at bass as, um, I mean, I, I, I love the bass guitar and I love, but I love it as something that enhances a song. I'm, I'm not the kind of player that necessarily needs to to you know, go crazy and show off on it or anything. Right. I mean, I love to at moments. There's 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 times for that, but but um, you know, I'm really all about the song, anyways. So which is kind of so so, bass playing and producing sort of go hand in hand for me. Um, so no, there it's not difficult at all. I um, I think I kind of think of everything somewhat through the lens of of the producer, anyways. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, that's always interesting to me. You know, like it's. You know, there, there's certain egos that would not be able to do that. And I, I'm, right. not, I'm not even speaking of anybody in particular. I'm just saying certain types yeah. of people wouldn't no, be able to, like, right. oh, I'm going to cut you're my exactly heart in half. Right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, oh, it's, this is an aside. It's one of my questions. I was listening to the, the single off the new album. And, yeah, as usual, you're, 
I love your tone. It's it's a little bit gritty, but it's got just great definition. Like you can just tell the the different notes. It's a perfect tone for me. Round and kind of fat, but it's not muddy. If that makes sense. But yeah, no, no, that's what I was going for. <laughs> cool. yeah, yeah. Oh, I was going for muddy and awful. Um, yeah. Now, did you guys record as a group, or were you like laying down parts remotely and independently? You know, because I know well, you guys. Well, I mean, Robertson and well, Warren, and you know, you all guys... the all the tracks were done here at my studio. Okay, so not remotely. Uh, but they were done separately. Uh, in other words, um, it started off with George and I writing. And so George's tracks kind of came first, really, sure. as we were writing uh, George's rhythm tracks. You know, and we were writing to a drum machine. And then I would write, you know, then I would do a bass part. And I, I liked it when George wasn't there for all the bass parts, but I liked it when he was because he's got great ideas, too. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to have somebody kind of help me in that department when, you know, when I'm doing that. So... Um, so, so he was there and very helpful on some of the bass parts. Um, but, but, uh, so then the rhythm guitars and the bass were done, the rhythm guitars and all the, a lot of the layered guitars were also done while we were writing just to kind of really get a very accurate picture of what we were going for. Sure. And on most of the song, not all, but most of the songs, um, Robert came in and we would, we would, uh, he and I would work on the vocals, the lyrics and melodies together. Um, and, um, he came in with a lot of lyrics and we wrote to a lot of this stuff still with the drum machine so that when Mick came in, he knew exactly what the songs were and he was able to lay down drums knowing what the songs were in most cases. There were a couple where he did the drums before we did vocals, but right. most of them were done, um, knowing the vocals, which is, which is a great way to do it. Then you really know where to put the drum fills and you really know where to put right. everything that you need from the drums. Uh, so it was it was done independently but not remotely right yeah it, it's that's a catch-22 if you lay down all the drums at once it's then you've got oh this fill is great but these toms walk all over this vocal part or this, exactly this exactly it happens a lot and um i was glad we didn't have to deal with it i mean listen there's ways to edit those things these days that are much easier than back mm -hmm. in the day but um it was still it was great to have that luxury and um it was it was uh it made for what really feels like a band record to me because you know the good thing about having a rhythm section of George and Mick and I who have played together a million right. times we do know how to make it feel you know like we're playing live even when we're not because we have done it so many times well you can, I'm sure you can anticipate each other to a certain extent after all this time of course you know a lot of mind reading going on yeah <clears throat> now you've actually answered my next question to some degree I was gonna ask if you and George when you're writing together, do you ever suggest parts for each other? Oh, yeah. yeah. All, oh, all the time. Yeah, it's got to be. I would think that after all these years, there's not a, hey, this is my part. I'll no, no, this. no. That's one of the beautiful things about our collaboration. There's no ego between right. us when we're working. That's cool. Um, I've always wondered, you know, George does an interesting thing, and you're a good person to ask. I've had somebody else about this before. He's got a... He's not the only one, but he's the most prominent guitar player I can think of. And the first one I remember noticing years ago is when he... A lot of his vibrato, instead of bending up and down, he slides fret to fret, which, right. is, which is not real typical. Um, right. But I've always liked that that little. He's got a lot of little, neat little quirks about that. But has he always done that? Is that something you remember him picking up at some point? Or? I don't. He has, um, and and probably before that. Um, yeah, no, that was one of the first things I noticed about him when I when I first met him, and I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. And he's got a real soulful way of playing, and and it is totally his own. I mean, he. Even though he's influenced by other people, you know, he didn't actually sit down and learn a lot of songs by people. He just kind of listened to their styles and then went and emulated it right. and kind of formed his own. I mean, one of the things that always cracked me up about George is the way he practices guitar is he'll put on like he'll put on a set of headphones. He'll have one side on. And in it will be like, say, Jeff Beck or something. Yeah. And then what he says, he just jams along with it. But he, he's not really learning it. It's, he's just using it to inspire him to play. <laughs> that makes sense, yeah. And that's how, I think that's one of the ways why, how he created such a unique style. Pretty cool. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That's that's pretty cool. That's an, I'll have to try that. The, um, now, when you're producing and even just playing by yourself, milking around the studio, do you still use a lot of traditional rigs or are you using like modeling tools like the Kemper and stuff like that now? Uh, well, I, I'll tell you what, I, I do have 
Um, especially for guitar, mm -hmm. I've got I've got some wonderful amps um, that yeah, I really love. I got a '68 Plexi that I love. I got a Marshall 2000 that Red Beach absolutely loves because um, I just recorded with him recently. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, you know, I've got several amps that are really cool. Um, I, and I also have a '71 SVT that is absolutely nice. my favorite SVT in the world. However, having said that. For bass, strangely enough, the SVX plug-in, both there's one by Universal Audio and one by IK Multimedia, mm -hmm. both of them are fabulous. Wow. And I oftentimes have tried tracking with the real SVT and tracking with that, and a lot of times the SVX will win out. Uh, it seems to, to sound better in the track. There are certain things where my SVT is really, really great, and there's, there's no plug-in that could ever beat it. Wow. But for a lot of things, um, those two plugins are just incredible, and uh, I couldn't live without those. That's the really cool thing about uh, recording has gone through these phases, and I've spoken to a lot of musicians and producers that, you know, the digital thing for the longest time it was, oh, you'll never be analog warmth, you'll never, but it really is a pain in the butt. And it's finally come to the, the point yes. now where the digital is damn good. And it's, yeah, it is. Well, the converters are really good now. I mean, I still think that the secret with digital is having really warm analog front end. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of old vintage mic pre's, for instance. Okay. And I do like to use, you know, great amps and vintage amps that really have the tone. I have an old 1953 Pultec EQ that I like to especially put on guitars. Nice. Uh, it, it just So if you warm it up with things like that before it goes into Pro Tools, um, it does... It does really help, in my opinion. Sure. Um, even Pro Tools themselves now with the HDX format, it's those converters are damn good. Yeah, yeah, it, it's come a long way. Um, sure has. Now I'm going to turn a corner here. When you're when you're playing uh, live with Foreigner, how faithful do you stay to the older bass lines when you're playing the older stuff? I mean, do you you've got to really I mean, branch out some, but you can't play just off the wall. No, I, I, I'm actually pretty true, on, especially on parts that I think are really critical. And, sure. and listen, that's one of the things. I was a Foreigner fan before I joined the band. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I loved about them is, is the way they made their records. And I loved the way the bass tracks were. I thought the bass tracks were great. And, and Rick Wills is one of my favorite bass players on record. I mean, yeah. he's just incredible. Um, so I try and stay pretty true as much as I can. Um, there are times live when we do things or stretch things out and, you know, add sections or whatever that, you know, of course I, you know, do something different there. But, um, but when it's important or, you know, a lot of the, like waiting for a girl like you, yeah. I would venture to say I play that absolutely note for note off the record because I think it was absolute perfection. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Sure. Yeah. That's a pretty iconic baseline too. It sure um, is. Yeah. Now, when you're writing a song, <clears throat> I don't even know if it's if it's the same, but what do you picture or hear first in your head? Do you hear, like, a, does it seem to evolve out of a riff, a chord sequence, or it can it be just like a mood in general? Well, you know, it, it can come from all all sources. So I, I, you know, the answer is E, all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, you know, sometimes I hear riffs, sometimes I hear a vocal hook, sometimes I hear maybe a chord pattern or, or, or something, um, you know, it, it's always different. Um, not always. I mean, I, there, there's, I guess there's only so many choices, but, um, but you know, there's no set pattern, put it that way. Right. So I, I kind of let, you know, whatever is the case, sometimes in writing too, I just get inspired, you know, I mean, we're, we're working on a record and, and, you know, we're in that zone and I'll, I'll just all of a sudden just, start picking up a guitar and I'll start playing something and it's like something I want to, you know, I grab my cell phone and I record it real yeah. quick, but it, it's, I know it's going to turn into something. So it, it's also has to do with momentum. Momentum is a big thing, I think. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm always interested in that because I, I'm not a musician, but I, I'm a hobbyist and I've played guitar for years, but I don't know theory really. So a lot of times in my head, I actually visualize the fingerings, if that makes sense. Sure. Like I Absolutely. Just, I, I just visualize the pattern and whatever, and so I may not know that, you know, whatever, whatever, but that's how I tend to visualize my head. But um, when I hear it in my head, I don't know that it's in the key of E necessarily until I start playing it. Does that make sense? Well, yeah. I mean, and a lot of times I, I don't necessarily know 
the key either if I'm just hearing something in my head. I don't have perfect pitch. I got relative pitch, but not perfect pitch. Mm. Um, although sometimes there are definitely times when I hear it in my head and I can just tell what key it's going to be in just kind of instinctively. Gotcha. Um, but there's no set pattern. I mean, I think that's the whole beauty of it is that there is no set pattern. I'm usually in the key of off. <laughs> um, now, do you have a, a habit when you're writing? Do you tend to write on keys or guitar or bass, or does it whatever, whichever way the idea strikes you or what's around? Well, yeah, it's kind of whatever idea strikes me. I mean, um, I've got a beautiful grand piano in my living room that you know, almost every time I sit in front of it, something comes out. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and, and in fact, I, I just did a uh, project with Red Beach and Robin, Robin McCauley is on vocals. Yeah. And, uh, there's a song on the record that um, I wrote right after seeing the Queen movie. Yeah. I came home and I sat down at the grand piano and pretty much wrote exactly the chorus that uh, that we have. Um, just <laughs> coming straight to the movie. Um, and it is a bit Queen-like, but... Um, but then, you know, a lot of times I write things on guitar. Sometimes I write, you, you write things when you're just messing around. Sometimes you hear something in your head and you'll grab any instrument. I mean, I, and I, I've had that happen with bass, too. So, again, no real set pattern, no habit. Um, I think the only habit is, I mean, I do, I probably mess around on guitar the most. Okay. Uh, I probably mess around on guitar more than I mess around on keys. But, but keys also make a great thing for messing around on. Yeah, okay. Now, the M Machine, it's what, March 22nd, it's being released, I believe? That is correct. Um, uh, you've got a few dates announced, but I know you guys have, I mean, I haven't really looked at everybody's schedules, but I mean, you got Robert and with Warren, and you got to have busy schedules. Do you think there'll be more touring beyond those dates, or will be kind of a wait and see? Well, I hope so, but until it is, it's wait and see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can imagine it's pretty busy, because one of the things, I mean, you got with, with Foreigner and this, and, and over the years and you've done Warner all this. works a lot. <laughs> yeah, they do, I can tell. And, you know, George has been busier in the last 10 years than he was all through the 80s. I mean, it's, obviously you guys were married to the docking thing for a large part of that, but, I mean, with Doug Pennick and, I mean, just back with Oni, and yeah. all the stuff he's been putting out, and it's all good stuff, It's you guys are busy. Now, one thing I want to ask you um, to kind of wrap up, is you've worked with so many great vocalists. I mean, some of the best. You got Kelly Hansen, Don Dockin, Ronnie James Dio, Rob Mason. I mean, just everything. But I want to know if you ever think you'll get back to lead vocals, like with War and Peace or TNN. I mean, you've got a great lead voice. Well, well, thank you. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's not a huge priority for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would, you know, if I had the time and. You know, could set the time aside. I'd love to do a record of my own little rock record, I suppose. Right. Uh, where I would want to sing. I've got songs sitting around for that. But um, but I, you know, again, I I am kind of busy and and I kind of look at it like feels like there's other things to do first. Okay. Feels that are more important. But you know, I mean, having said that, there is there is definitely a part of me that would love to do a record. And it, it's not even just singing, although singing would be fun. But, you know, I'm also kind of of the mindset of, God, if I can find somebody that I like, whose voice I like better, I'd rather have them. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, it's all those, there's so many stories about that. I mean, you're a great singer. I mean, from what I hear, it's, uh, I've never spoken to him about it, but back in the, the Blue Murder days, I guess John Sykes tried everybody before he finally sang himself, and he ended up being a great singer. Um, yeah, well, yeah, just, I, and I, I get that. Yeah, I, yeah, it's, I, I do. I do get that. I mean, um, although, I mean, John's got a really great voice. I mean, I think his that that his vocal performance on that first Blue Murder Murder record was just so great. It was a, such a surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, although I kind, I guess I kind of knew somewhere along the line that he was that good. But um, but anyways, yeah. I mean, again, it's it's something I would probably like to do someday. But but it's not a huge priority. I mean, I got a lot of things in mind first. So, so it's we'll not charting you up to put something else out. No, it's, it's really not. That's good. Well, um, before we let you go, I mean, I want to make sure everybody knows where to uh, check in with everything you've got going on as far as your website, your endorsements, the end machine. I mean, what do we need to be on the lookout for or well, check know, in with you? So right now, end machine's got a video out called Alive Today. Right. 
And, and so you can use YouTube that just the end machine alive today and you'll find it right away. Um, you know, go to frontiers records and, and, and order the record if you can, uh, pre-order it. Um, we've got the shows coming and there's going to be VIP packages for all that. So that's great. Um, I'm the real Jeff Pilson on Instagram and I think I'm at Jeff Pilson on Twitter and, uh, on Facebook, I'm the Jeff Pilson fan page. So all of those would be great places to go and check in and um and then after that ask michael regan because he's much more in touch with that stuff than i am <laughs> right <laughs> better at that stuff than i am yeah no problem um well that's perfect oh and then one other thing if you guys could just uh go out of your way and just schedule one concert in knoxville tennessee that'd be perfect and that way i can sure swing by <laughs> if, as long as that's no trouble I, I wish i wish that were an easier thing to do i, I love playing down in that part of the world so Love to do that. It's all good. I'll, I'm sure I'll, I'll be back in front of you guys on stage at some point. But anyway, I really want to thank you, Jeff. It's been a blast, and I'm looking forward to the album. So my pleasure, Peter. I'm I'm really glad that you're you're excited about it because we are too. And uh, yeah, hopefully, you know, the more excited that fans get, and the more involved fans get in the new product from from art, the artists that they love, um, the more that those artists will have opportunities to make that product. So absolutely. Uh, and and so it's great to see people supporting it, and I hope people enjoy it, and I can't wait till it gets out there. Absolutely, yeah. Well, uh, thanks again, and uh, I will talk to you soon, Jeff. Thank you so much, Peter. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.